Hello there. Thank you very much for joining us on the Tuesday edition of Journalist Hangout. I am Bukola Samuel Wemimo. Today on the program, Jenko's accused transmission company of Nigeria, Disco's of hindering 4,000 megawatts generation daily. INEC identifies 270 polling units as flashpoints in Ondo governorship election as Inspector General deploys DIG others to coordinate security operations. Police Service Commission to meet on fate of 10,000 constables as appeal court rules that PSC, not police force, mandated by law to handle recruitment. I will be hanging out with Babajide Koladi Otitoju while Mayor Akikpelu will join us via Skype. Journalist Hangout starts now. The quantum of electricity generated in Nigeria is rejected or forced to be reduced by an average of 4,210 megawatts daily due to transmission and distribution constraints, power generation companies claim. They further allege that the forced reduction of generated electricity has dragged on for several years. The Association of Power Generation Companies, APGC, stressed that the supply growth from pre-privatization to date shows that available generation capacity, which was 3,427.5 megawatts, had increased by 138.34 percent to 8,169 megawatts for a country that hopes to someday achieve 24-hour power supply. Of course, this is not the way to go. Welcome once again to the program as I also welcome Babajide Kolade Utitoju. Good evening. Welcome to the program. Evening, we also boss. have Mayor Akikpelu joining us via Skype. Welcome Mayor. It's good to see you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so Babajide, the um, generation companies, have they particularly told us anything new, bearing in mind that there were always infrastructure challenges in Nigeria's power sector? Mm, I think generally what they have said is the truth. But um, they also, uh, from, the, from the story, I could see clearly that they didn't talk about the fact that on their part, on their part, they could generate much more than they are generating currently, um, but they are held back seriously by gas constraints. I thought they would also be talking about that, but they are focused on the problems that the um, other parts of the value chain are going through that um, ensure that we do not have as much supply of electricity that we should have as a nation. Yes, I've always talked about the fact that the Transition Company of Nigeria, they have issues with infrastructure. Mm -hmm. Some of the transmission lines are too old. Therefore, they cannot wheel all that is generated. The, 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 the generating capacity is higher than what we can wheel, what the, the transmission can wheel. That is a fact. I've talked about this so many times. Now it's the Jenkos saying the same thing. It is true that we have that problem. And I've also praised this government because what we are facing with TCN is um, a problem of uh, refusal on the part of successive government to invest, invest in that subsector of the power sector. You know, if they had been invest in the way the current administration has invested, right from when Fashola was minister, in the transmission uh, uh, leg, then we won't have this problem. So there are issues with transmission, there are issues with distribution. No doubt about it. All the sectors have their own problems. What we do not want to see is constant um, uh, blame game between them. For example, the Egme Thermal Station, which is the largest uh, thermal station in West Africa, they have six turbines. They've never been able to use all their six, all turbines, six turbines because of, uh, of uh, gas constraints. 
we have um, power plants, Papa Lanto, Omotosho, Geregu, all of them. They all face gas constraints. Now, ideally, we should have cited power plants close to gas supply. Well, that's not what we have. When you go look, look at the, the far north, for example, as big as the far north is, there are no power plants there. It's also, uh, there are no um, gas-fired power plants there because of this same problem of gas supply. So what we have lately in the north are the hydro plants. They don't need gas to fire them. Mm. We have the hydro plants. But the hydro plants are old. I think um, some of them were even built in the 60s, like um, like uh, the Kanji um, Dam, for example. The, built in the 60s, they cannot produce or um, they cannot, uh, generate power at the level they used to generate. We also need to do a lot of desilting so that um, we can get the best out of them. The way things are now, they can't even give us up to a quarter of what we need. I think that as a nation, I'm, I am ashamed of the fact that we are going through this in terms of power generation. When you look at uh, SATA, we always call ourselves the, the biggest economy in Africa. I would rather we call ourselves the most industrialized economy in Africa. That is a title that the South Africans uh, uh, have, which we can't even challenge. South Africa has a generating capacity of 51,000 megawatts. megawatts. Largely, in spite of its challenges. Largely from uh, uh, coal. And they generate on the average 46,000 megawatts daily. We are talking about uh, about 4,000 megawatts. 8,000 to 4,000. Even the 8,000, they are saying 4,000 4, is literally shortened. So it's 4,000 that the so-called giant of Africa generates. And I'm telling you that even in spite of South Africa um, generating 41, uh, 46,000 megawatts, they still buy electricity from Namibia, from uh, Mozambique, from the hydro, uh, hydro plants in those countries. They still buy. They, they, they still uh, buy from Zimbabwe. So I really don't know the way we have, there's no way we can make progress under the current arrangement. Huh? I don't really enjoy it when these people uh, the trade blame here and there, oh, it's your fault, it's my fault. They, there must be what you call alignment of all the value chains. If you generate so much and uh, they can't will as much as you generate, what is the, what is what the, is point? the, the point? If you generate so much and they can't distribute as much as you generate, what is the point? There has to be that alignment. They don't, that kind of problem, we, we, they don't face in other countries. It is only in our country with our peculiar, the peculiar nature of our power sector that we are facing this problem and then they are blaming themselves instead of providing us with the electricity that we really, really need for us to grow as a nation. Yeah, for economic transformation, more importantly. Uh, Mayor, Babajiri has said something about gas supply being the problem and most of those stations are not situated close to gas supply. The Nigeria Gas Company is fully in charge of um, gas supply and it is owned by the NNPC. How can it be made to function more effectively? Yeah, let me start by saying that I, I blame Ambassador for, for this problem. Why am I blaming Ambassador for this problem? Ambassador took a decision to invest a lot of money on infrastructures when it comes to electricity. But he made one fundamental error. He spent billions of dollars, billions of dollars. And most of the most of the most of the investment was in um, 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 gas flared turbines. If he had if he had had the foresight to invest in another transmission line we won't have this problem that we're having now. I mean, he, he invested billions of dollars in several, several, several um, glass flared turbines without, without the gas powered turbines, without looking at the transmission of it. And now we don't have the kind of money that was invested in his time. That is one. Two, it is wrong of us 
to have invested so much in gas powered turbines when we know that the only company that is providing to providing this gas can only use pipelines to get this gas to these stations and it is easy for saboteurs and economic saboteurs and those who work in the creek to sabotage it so and that is the problem we've only had over time somebody will cut the the pipe somewhere and then you will not be able to get gas to those stations and they will have to shut down so we we made a a major mistake and we are still making that mistake now because the mistake we are making now is that no matter the investment we put no matter the innovation we do that if we don't solve the problem of transmission we will have a problem the second problem has to do with the distribution the distribution the major problem we have in distribution which we have to face is that we have to pay a price that will encourage discos to want to do business. If you notice, in Lagos, what they have done, especially Ikeja and Ikeja Disco, is to try to talk to estates. They will go to different estates, in Magodo, in Omole, in GRE, to say, look, we want you to pay premium price. And when you agree to that premium price, they give you electricity almost 24, 24 hours. In where I stay in Omole, in where I stay in Omole, we uh, the the the, the uh, 500 500 um, 500 the the diesel that I normally use for three weeks five weeks at the most now I'm still using it in three months but the price that we are paying is very high we pay an average of about seventy thousand eighty thousand a month so it shows that if the price is, the pricing is right this this course will give electricity. But sometimes they're not encouraged to do that and they don't want to disable because they believe that it does not pay them to give a lot of people electricity. Mm. And you know, because the increase, the increase in price is something that people don't want. It's a very, it's a very bad thing. Government will want to come in and say, okay, don't want, they want to delay the pricing and all that. And until we get that right and allow people to pay more for what they pay now, this course will not want to do business. Which is where we are and uh, I recall the last time we had the conversation on cost-reflective tariff. Um, it was negotiation, ongoing negotiation between the federal government and labor. Now, Babajide, you talked about, you touched on that when you talked about um, the blame game between them. Now, can the federal government, does it have the moral right to accede to the demand of discourse to implement cost-reflective tariff when infrastructure has not been made fully available in the power sector? I've said before that um, increase in tariff will not necessarily ta uh, translate to improvement in electricity supply. Some people will have, some people will not have. I've always said that, look, that you enjoy electricity does not mean it has improved everywhere. It's an illiterate way of uh, um, looking at it to okay. say, oh, electricity has improved because you now have consistent electricity. There are millions of other people who do not have. 200 million people, 8,000 megawatts can't be enough for 200 million people. People need to understand that. You go to some states, states like Taraba, you know, uh, many states, people don't even enjoy two hours of electricity in a day. Some of us, like where I live, and I've said it before, just that I don't want to really... Um, uh, um, draw these people out, if I can use that Nigerian language. Sometimes, in three days, I may not even get electricity. And I'm not the only one. Sometimes it's only in the night they bring it, before daybreak is gone. Because it is tied to both the generating capacity, the distribution capacity, and the willing capacity. Until you, you can say that you have reached your potential. You cannot say that we are getting enough or that we are, we are doing enough. We are, not, we are not doing well in that sector. That's a fact. And we suggested in the past that look, look, look um, think about alternative sources of electricity generation. If Brazil can, can depend 
so much on hydro, generating more than 100,000 megawatts from hydro alone. That's Brazil. Why is it that we cannot exploit the opportunity for, for a greater uh, electricity generation through hydro or through um, um, even uh, solar? Between Kano and Jigawa State, we have um, probably the hottest part of our country. But we are not investing in other sources of electricity generation. The wind is there. We can we exploit wind. We are not doing that. Mambilo hydropower Man, plant. Mambilo, yes, yeah, been there. I thought that this year uh, that they will put it in the budget for last year. You know, we didn't put it in the budget. I, I've not seen the the president's budget document for 2021. 2021. Yeah, we, I don't know if it's there. The question is, for how long are we going to allow it to continue to waste? Something that will give us, even in dry season, will give us a minimum of 3,600 megawatts. And, and which, according to experts, is cheap. It's, it's, it's cheap and, 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 and less uh, poisonous to the environment. But we, we're just wasting time. On the average, what we do in the course of a year is about 4,000 megawatts. Many times we do below 4,000 megawatts. Sometimes we do 2,000 megawatts in a whole day. In this country, sometimes we even suffer system Zero. failure. So, and there is three thousand six hundred megawatts just waste, wasting away after about thirty-three uh, years, just there. Sometimes we will insert it in the budget, deceive ourselves that we that uh, we are going to work on it. Nothing, nothing happens. People have made money off that Mambila project, yet there is no road that leads to the place. At least I can testify. I went there. There, yeah. No road. You saw me riding on a cab that are true footpaths, mm -hmm. you know. So, this is the thing there is a lot. I do, this blame game every sector, every subsector, or every uh, leg of the power uh, chain has its problem. Mm -hmm. The Jenkos can be you can see now, just wait after a few days, you see that uh, this course will respond to Jenko. This is not what we want. Let the government provide meters for everyone. That way we can gauge power uh, consumption effectively. It's verifiable. But we have a situation in which we can't provide meters for everyone that needs a meter. And people are at the mercy of this course. They are cheating our people and getting away with it. Because we can't provide meters for everyone. It's is, is really, a really sad situation. But going forward, Mayor, there was a time Siemens German company was beginning to emerge in the power conversation in Nigeria. What aspects can Siemens be charged with if it can truly help Nigeria transform its power supply situation such that the local investors, too, their work will not be threatened? I think um, I I would prefer I would prefer Siemens to to come in in the area of transmission, you know, because that is our major problem. The the, the transmission line that we have is old, and and it's not it's not fit for 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 modern business. You 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 have to we have to bring in a company that can give us modern power lines and then decentralize it. Because you see, having one line to power through the whole country, in my own opinion, is not advisable. Because when you have system collapse, which which happens regularly, you know, when you when you have power lines in the six geopolitical zones that can serve each geopolitical zone, which Siemens can do effortlessly, that will that will make it easier for us to distribute whatever is generated. Then, like. Um, um, Babajide said, we can now look at other options of generating electricity. Uh, I've always said, that's why I, one of the reasons why I blame um, President Obasanjo. He meant well, he wanted to solve the problem. But he made a fundamental error because at that time, they were able to get billions of dollars to put into this thing, and everything was just turbines. But now we should look at solar, we should look at each area of the country and see where they have comparative advantage. So in the north, we can do solar. In the south, we can do hydro. And then that will now complement all these gas turbines that we have. And it is easy to do that. 
Siemens can do a pass to con concentrate on the transmission, and then we can now generate electricity because distribution will not be as difficult. Distribution is relatively easier. Yes. Mm -hmm. Because if, 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 if you if you if you provide everybody meter, and there is and there is and there is and there is, and there is a billing system that is advisable that is uh, um, that is that is that the discos are comfortable with, and you can confirm what people are using in their homes, and you and you get a relatively good price for it, and you have enough transmission. We have a power line that can that can transmit the uh, the electricity generated to you. I think we will solve this problem. That is why it is. I find it so amusing that for years we kept saying we are going to solve this problem, and we are still stuck at 3,000, 4,000 megawatts, which is for a country like Nigeria is is just ridiculous. This is so ridiculous. Us, you can say you can say that system. again. And so for power, one point that resonates from your analysis now is that government should look at areas where we have comparative advantage and focus on it. Yes, indeed, you're still yeah. on to journalists hangout on TVC. We'll go for a break, but still to come. INEC identifies 270 polling units as flashpoints in Ondo governorship election as IG deploys DIG others to coordinate security operations. Stay with us. We'll be right back. It's still journalists hang out on TVC. Criminals are believed to favor on dark spots and hidden places in carrying out their heinous activities. And to prevent this in the Ondo October 10 governorship election, the Independent National Electoral Commission has enlisted security agencies to flush out threats in creeks and dark spots in Eseudo and Ilaje local government areas of the state, which have 62 creeks and more than 270 polling units. Due to the peculiarity of the terrain, the riverine communities have been flashpoints in previous elections in the state. But Festa Sokoye, INEX National Commissioner, says to ensure a peaceful election in the areas, the Nigerian Navy and Marine Police have asked, have been asked to protect and escort INEC personnel and materials. He adds that no stone will be left unturned in preventing rigging and violence in the election. As we continue with the conversation, it's understandable that there is concern for Ilaje and Eseudu because of militancy mm -hmm. in the area. But isn't it more important to have that, uh, those parts of Ondo secure beyond electioneering times? Well, um, there had been steps taken in the past to um, deal with the restiveness in the area. And um, one of those steps um, was the, the, the militarization of the area through amnesty, for militants in the area and the um, um, the army the army of the local actors in the perennial violence in the area um, I think the government has done well um, in that regard getting those youths to disarm and then um, giving them amnesty and then um, taking development to some of those areas because the people sometimes will insist that uh, you must bring development to our area otherwise we riot. So government has done um, fairly well uh, in trying to calm uh, the restiveness in that part of the state. But um, by, by fact of geography, the riverine area, the riverine area will always be dangerous to go to on election day, uh, especially in elections where the stakes are high, like uh, it is the case in Delta State in uh, Bayesa. Riverine areas are usually dangerous places to go to, and although um, won't be an exception because it is in these areas that ballot boxes are usually hijacked um, in speed boats and taken to God knows where uh, to be um, ballot materials are hijacked to, to, for uh, random turn, turn printing by a few individuals to happen, uh, thereby subverting the will of the people. Well, I think the police are making good efforts initially. The IG wanted to send um, 24,000 men to the area, but now 
is decided to send the 33,783 of uh, his people. And out of this, about 3,000 uh, special police personnel. So the operations people uh, are 30,000. So this is commendable and about 5,000 would, um, the other security agencies will weigh in with about 5,000 um, of their own men and women to help secure the area. But it is not the number of policemen, the number of soldiers that you send to a place that matters. It is their professionalism and their uh, neutrality that is um, most important. I've seen soldiers rig election. I've seen soldiers hijack um, collation centers to happen in uh, River State in the last election. So just trying to rig election as if that is their duty. You are not politicians. You can't turn yourself to politicians. I've seen policemen join the politicians in rigging elections. Yes, politicians are incorrigible, but most policemen join them in rigging elections if they know what they are doing. So this is the thing. That is that neutrality that is important. It's the neutrality that will make either the PDP or the APC or the uh, ZLP or the ZLP, you call them, that will make them um, comfortable that they are in a contest that they are sure that is the person who deserves to win that will win. So this is the, that neutrality is important and um, coming from what happened in, um, from what we saw in the do, I expect the police to live up to expectation. The IG said they've learned some valuable lessons from uh, the election in Edo. We want to see that uh, replicated in uh, On Saturday in Edo State. In Edo. We don't want the election to be rigged. When we rig elections, we show to the whole world that we are barbaric people. We are not Stone Age people. It's barbaric people who rig elections. I'm not ashamed to say it. If you have an election rigger, then you are barbaric. You don't deserve to live with the rest of us. Let the people decide who they want. Don't rig the election. Don't force yourself on the people. Hmm. I hope our politicians... I hope, they, I hope yes, they listen. I hope they will listen. Mayor, neutrality. Are you confident that uh, it, the 33,000 yes, will, ex will demonstrate neutrality on Saturday? Yes, I am. I'm hopeful because the DIG that um, supervised the election in, um, in Edo... It's also the one that's going to supervise the one in Ondo. And if you recall, um, the security outfit, the security did um, a wonderful job in Edo. And everybody everybody um, praised their neutrality. And I think that um, we are going to see the same thing in, in Ondo because um, DIG layer is um, one of the best that we have in the force. Um, we're trained well schooled and I think he has the experience to be able to provide the necessary security that will that will make the people's way count. But my only problem is that um, because of the terrain, Elijah SLDO has always been very difficult. Because yes, they they are going to deploy naval officers. But it is important that they have to be on ground because because of the terrain, it is easier for them to, for woodlums to, to, to lead, unleash violence on people and discourage them from voting, and you know, and it's easy for them. So I will, I will advise that the, the, the police should make sure that they have officers and men on ground in those areas, and then the, the, the naval officers can, can, can cordon off the area through patrols, through constant patrols. So people cannot snatch ballot boxes and try to want to escape through a boat to another area to go and print. The, the, uh, and they have enough men, because when you have 33, and when you look at the other ones, if you have 38 officers and men in an area in that state, I think they should be able to stop people from doing what they used to do. Because um, in times past, it is in the Nevada areas that people pad boats. They they wait for they most times because of the terrain their their own their own their own boats come last and they can easily pad it to be able to have an advantage. So they should not allow those people. If we have enough men on ground and we have the naval people, we are providing the backup so that they won't be able to escape through the creeks. I think we'll have 
a free and fair election. And I'm hopeful that the people's will will count on Saturday. Mm, it's good to know that there is some optimism in that regard. But mm. uh, shouldn't we lose or enjoin the police now not to lose sight of um, uh, Akure, which is the voting block of uh, Ondo State. Mm. And uh, from the example of the local government election, you know, there were reports of violence, ballot box snatching. So shouldn't we enjoin the police now to also concentrate on, you know, that uh, part of the state? Oh, oh, you, um, you have a point, and we kindly encourage the police to beef up security everywhere. The campaigns in Ondo State have been characterized by violence in some areas. Not everywhere. Uh, even the hometown of the governor has not um, escaped um, the um, incidents of, incident of violence. So if that can happen in the hometown of the governor, it means that we have to be vigilant across the whole um, the whole state, you know, and they are just I think they're just a little over. Um, how many polling units that we have in the state? About 3,000 polling units um, in 18 local governments and 203 wards. I think the police should be able to police um, all of these um, uh, polling units, 3,009 polling units, 203 wards in the 18 local governments. I think they should be able to police everywhere. But I'm not happy with the reports of violence from inside the Akure town. People were firing at themselves from um, a war. And a few other places where we've had um, violence where really it's ugly. And I saw pictures of the governor visiting some of his supporters who were injured in the hospital. And um, uh, the PDP too have also accused APC of instigating violence. So the two uh, dominant parties they need to behave themselves. They need to talk to their, their, each other. Yes, you know, so to maintain the peace and ensure that we have a, a rank of free election on Saturday. Mayor, do you have concerns as well about Akure and Owo? Yeah, I yeah, I, I, I agree that um, we've seen cases of violence in those areas, but um, we have enough men. If the police really wants to do their job, we have enough men to be able to keep those people in check. Because when you have, when you have close to 38,000 officers and men, there are enough people to be able to. And you see, all these, all these miscreants, when they know that there is enough force on ground, they will not misbehave. It is when they see that they can take advantage of the situation if the security is lax, that is when they do those things. So if 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 the um, security people have enough resolve to say, look, we are not going to allow miscreants or anybody to misbehave. If we do that, you do that at your at at, at, at enormous risk mm -hmm. to yourself. Uh, you, the people will behave. Yes, we will still see we will still see pocket of violence there and there because you cannot you, you cannot that is that is taken. But what is important is that when you look at it. On the general scale, if there is enough security, I think we will have a good election. Oh, well, at least right. we'll, um, what happened here don't make me to be to be awful. Confidence, yes. So it doesn't matter the number of uh, police operatives that the force deploys to Ondo, or in fact any state of the federation for any election, but the professionalism and the neutrality that these men demonstrate is more critical. Still to come on Jelly's Hangout, police service commissioned to meet on fate of 10,000 constables as appeal court rules that PSC, that's police service commission, not police force, mandated by law to handle recruitment. Stay with us, we'll be right back. We're very glad to have you back. You're still on to Journalist Hangout on TVC. The fate of 10,000 constables will be decided by the Police Service Commission after a court of appeal sitting in Abuja affirmed the constitutional powers of the PSC to appoint persons into the Nigeria Police Force, nullifying the 2019 recruitment by the NPF and the ongoing 2020 recruitment into the constable cadre of the force. A victory for the rule of law is what the Police Services Commission calls this judgment. Gentlemen, 
how should this matter be handled? What are the options open to the Police Service Commission in deciding the fate of these 10,000 constables? Babajide, starting with you. It's, um, it's a bit dicey um, for some people within the commission. They believe that certain elements who ought not to have been uh, part of the even the screening um, managed to uh, get picked, you know, um, for um, enlistment into the into the force. And we just said that this was what even triggered the court case in the first place. I think that. It's just ego that was at work. Let's tell ourselves the truth. We like to divide ourselves. We use all kinds of issues to divide ourselves. About three attorney generals, former attorney generals of the Federation had their opinions on this matter. Two of those attorney generals believed that the PSC was mandated by law to um, carry, out recruitment. carry out recruitment, appointment, and all that. It's not just senior people that they are mandated to um, recruit into the force, but other categories of people. So, and then uh, one of the attorney generals uh, also believed that the police was right in the uh, step that uh, it had taken. For many people, looking at the army. The army recruits its own men and uh, officers. So the police would then think that they too should be able to recruit for themselves. I was spoken with policemen who said, how can someone else recruit someone who will come and work for me? How do I vouch for the quality of assessment that that person did? But the army does not have the equivalent of the police service commission. So that kind of argument is neither here nor there. If the constitution says do this, do that, then we have to we have to do it. We have to do it. That is what the law says. I see a clear failure of leadership in what has happened because if uh, there had not been uh, what we call um, ego or failure of leadership, they should have agreed. I expected the president to have waded in when this controversy began. What do you do about people that have been uh, recruited and trained? Do you then remove their uniforms and tell them to go back into the world? What are they going to become if we do that? So in my view, there still has to be a meeting point between both of them. Although for me, I do not even see the essence of this meeting that they are talking about that is being advertised because the IG has appealed this judgment. The IG has asked for a stay of execution through the Supreme Court. So they should wait until the final um, judgment on this matter before we know what next to do. And if at the end of the day the Supreme Court says it's the, uh, the PSC that has the power, then they have to find a way, maybe uh, subsequent recruitment. Because to simply send these people back home, I don't think uh, it will be right. Mm. To dismiss the entire exercise. I don't think it serves any any purpose. Any any anyone any purpose. Uh, Mayor, do you see the Supreme Court ruling upholding the judgment of the appeal court or going the way of the lower court on this matter? Yeah. Before we get to the Supreme Court, I believe that the law is the law. If the law says that the PSC should do recruitment, the Special General Police should not have exercised the power that it didn't have. But be that as it may, um, it has happened and we cannot throw the baby with the bathwater. So I think that those that have been recruited and have been incorporated into the service should be allowed to, to remain in the service. Subsequent... How, I'll uh, hold you on not throwing away the baby with the bathwater. Bath hold on on that thought. We want to go for a break now. We'll be right back.
The Akeredolu Ayedatiwa campaign organization cordially invites our dear president Muhammad Obuari GCFR, Vice President Yemi Oshiba TFR, Vice President Yemi Oshibajo GCON, Chairman APC National Caretaker and Extraordinary Convention Planning Committee, His Excellency Mai Malabuni, Chairman National Campaign Council, His Excellency Baba Jide Sonwolu, Progressive Governors, Members of the National Assembly and Leaders of our Great Party to the grand finale of our campaigns for the October 10 governorship election in Ondo date Wednesday 7th of October 2020 venue Akure Township Stadium at 10 a.m. come and be part of history as we march on again to victory APC next level 4 plus 4 8 announcer right honorable Victor Labinta director general Akeredolu Ayedatiwa campaign organization Welcome back. You're still on to Journalist Hangout on TVC. Before that break, we're looking at the appeal court ruling on uh, the dispute between the police service commission and the leadership of the police force. And Mayor was uh, on that topic telling us that the rule of law is what is more important. So, Mayor, take, take it over. Continue with your point. Yes, I, so I think that, yes, um, now, that the, now that the law says the PSC should have done the recruitment, it's unfortunate that that didn't happen. Why? But I think that since the, both the agency and the and the police want to serve the same thing to provide security for Nigerians, we should they should they should they should have a meeting point by allowing those that have been recruited and incorporated in the service to be. Then subsequent recruitment will be done by PSC, because like Zile said, it will be counterproductive. For us to train 10,000 men, then decommission them, and now send them into the world. We have sent 10,000 people that the police will spend a lot of time and resources fighting. We cannot afford that because these are people that have been trained to do a particular job. So to, to throw them into the labor market will be counterproductive. So uh, I think the PSC should allow that to be. It, it is part of... Um, establishing who has control over what. And now that that has been established, why the IG wants to appeal to the Supreme Court? They should, they should, they should allow the PSC to enjoy the relief that they, that they, that, that they seek from court and the, and the court by, 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 by being the one that will recruit the ones, the constables for this year. That is my advice to both PSC and, and, and the leadership of the police. But really, Babajide, if we looked at it critically, what are the lessons that we can draw from this uh, debacle, so to speak, between the PSC and the leadership of the police? Because if we look at the force, a force where the um, salary of the average police officer is about 42,000, what is the whole point of the leadership of the force spending so much uh, at, uh, in a battle at the courts? No, the, the, I'm not even um, bothered about the fact that they are, they, they are, they are spending money in court. I'm ashamed that they allowed it to degenerate to this point. Um, the president, as I said earlier, should have intervened uh, before it got to this point. And looking back, looking back, why was the police um, intent on going ahead? Why did the police go ahead with the recruitment, even when the Police Service Commission um, raised the, the, the red flag over it? They shouldn't uh, have gone ahead. They should have asked for um, judicial interpretation of that sec section or waited a little bit. But they went ahead, believing that once the recruitment had been done, it is fait accompli, nobody can do anything. But the way it is now, it's a very clumsy situation, and, and we, are, we are just talking here. We don't know what will happen, because if the PSC uh, still retains the belief that some people who did not pass through the screening, uh, screening process got into the force, it then means that they could be having a second look at those people, mm -hmm. which will result in some of those who had been 
screened, uh, trained, um, been, been shown the door. That's not what you, you want to see because if you send them back into the war, some of them will become criminals. They will be worse than bandits, mm. you know? So I, I think that there's a lesson here. There's a lesson here. Whatever decision it is that the Supreme Court will take, there's a lesson that we must, take, uh, we must learn from Absolutely. this. Absolutely. Two agencies of government must learn to work together. The dysfunctional uh, nature of the the some of the establishments uh, this uh, of uh, this government is the reason we have constant brickbats between two agencies of government that should be working uh, together, pulling in different directions. And we've already generated. The president should have called both men, called the uh, former IG Smith, and called the current IG. That look, this is what I want you guys to go and do. The same way intervened and they solved the problem the crisis in the APC. That's what should have happened in this case. But it didn't happen until the, the, this embarrassing court uh, case happened. Now, once a decision is taken, you have no choice. Once but the highest court it. in the land says, oh, Mr. IG, you are wrong. You shouldn't have carried out this exercise. The exercise is null and void. You have no choice. We tail in between legs. You, you just have to assemble, uh, accept uh, uh, the, decision. The, the, the decision of the court. Yeah. Uh, Mayor, very quickly, what lessons should we take away? The lessons is that we should learn to we should learn to obey the law. If we practice democracy, the demo, the bedrock of democracy is the rule of law. We have to obey the law. The problem in this country is that some of our leaders think they can just do whatever they like, and they don't want to obey the law because the law is very clear about it. The PNC is the one that has the the constitutional right to do the recruitment, the IG didn't agree, but we've learned that people should not people should not exercise the power that they don't have. And then I also want to say that the president should should do his job. We have a president who sometimes does not bother what goes on in his government. It is it is not right for two agencies of government to 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 engage in this kind of yes. um, rivalry mm -hmm. and that will it, affect it, the, 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 in, in, the... Indeed, it, it is needless. We, we must wrap FIRS it up now. And, uh, is it uh, which uh, other agency overstand duty for this? All right, we must wrap it up now, but it's instructive that agencies of government must learn to work together. If indeed they learn to work together, then there will be no need for third parties. That's all on Genlis Hangout. Join us again tomorrow for another edition of the program. You can also watch Genlis Hangout on other platforms showing on your screen and on YouTube at youtube.com forward slash TBC News Nigeria. Our feedback channel is Genlis Hangout at tbcnews.tv. I am Bukola Samuel Wemmo. Bye for now and God bless Nigeria. <laughs>